How do you attack the Washington receivers after the Jahan Dotson trade? Which Bills wideout is going to step forward in the wake of Curtis Samuel's turf toe? And who will be the 2024 HSF at Bauer hype guy? Plus, nine-time FFPC League champion Brian Donville joins the show to talk about Bengals backs, Patriots pass catchers, and much more. We've got a great show for you live from the 2024 Kentucky Fantasy Football State Championship at Caesars Southern Indiana. Brian Donville is here. I'm Eric Balkman. Stick around. Your high stakes fantasy football hour starts now. Broadcast live and heard around the world. You are now watching the most entertaining hour of radio on the planet. Welcome to the high stakes fantasy football hour presented by MyFFPC.com with your hosts, Eric Balkman and Farrell Elliott. The High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour is your home for analysis from the best players in the world. And now, because no one else was available, here are Eric Baltman and Farrell Elliott. Solace in the scripture, are we not all our fathers' sons? I became a man, nobody ever told me what a man was. Thank you, Rob. Greetings and salutations to all you Balkaholics and X tuning in to the latest episode of the High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour brought to you by the Fantasy Football Players Championship over at myffpc.com. Hi, hello, and welcome. I'm Eric Balkman. You know me from the road of his High Stakes Lowdown, the FFPC, and this show, as well as the Better Sports Network's High Stakes Fantasy Football Show. Uh, connect with me on the X at Eric Balkman. Uh, we have a great show tonight. And I'll bring in my co-host right away. Actually, before I bring in my co-host, I'll give you this reminder. If you want to connect with us on X, you can do so at HSFF Hour. Brian Donville, who is tonight's uh, co-host, I'll bring him in. He's at Brian underscore Donville on the X as well. Check out Farrell's Kentucky Fantasy Football State Championship at KFFSC.com. Uh, listen, if you don't have... Um, you're not going to make it to Louisville this weekend. It's fine because everything's filled up for the live events, but there's plenty of online stuff over at KFFSC.com. Check that out. Facebook.com slash HSFFR is where to reach us. And of course, high stakes fantasy football at gmail.com. If you have any questions or comments or you want to weigh in on who the hype guy is going to be, I will try to get to all the chat room questions, um, the X posts and, and emails throughout the show tonight. Um, I'm flying solo, no producer, no audio engineer. So hopefully Fingers crossed this works out tonight on this uh, on the internet uh, connection that we have here. Um, Fantasy Pros Championship drafts continue to pop off. As a reminder, at some point this week, we are going to be closing the six-hour slow drafts for the Fantasy Pros Championship, the FFPC main event, um, and uh, our best ball tournaments. Basically, all six-hour slow drafts will be shut down at some point uh, this week. So if you want to get in the slow draft, now's your last chance. Fantasy Pros Championship, we have drafts popping off tonight at 11 o'clock midnight and 1 a.m., so you have plenty of chances to take your shot in a million-dollar grand prize uh, in a $6 million prize pool. Same thing with the FFPC main event, two contests with two separate million-dollar grand prizes. We're going to make two millionaires this year, and those have live drafts, uh, slow drafts via the two-hour variety, too. We'll continue in all our formats, including the main event and the Fantasy Pros Championship coming up uh, over the course of next week as well. Uh, check out the Empire Dynasty Leagues and Dynasty Leagues we have over at myffpc.com. Let's bring in tonight's guest uh, guest co-host tonight. He's uh, already won nine FFPC league titles under his belt. He's looking for much more this year as he chases a million-dollar grand prize in the Fantasy Pros Championship. He's a guy that drafted at the Kentucky Fantasy Football State Championship Cincinnati edition uh, the weekend before, and he'll be able to spill uh, all his knowledge that he learned from drafting in that tonight. You follow him on the X at Brian under score Donville. It's Brian Donville. Brian, welcome and thanks so much for hanging out with me on this Friday yeah. night. Thanks, Balky. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be great. I, I'm looking forward to it. I, it's it's going to be a fun show. And anytime we get to announce the hype guy, which we'll <laughs> do so at the end of the show tonight, it's always going to be fun. Uh, yeah, Dom Gazzetti uh, already pumping in. I had a conversation with him um, uh, before we went on tonight, we have the only fan setting in the hotel room tonight. So, and the, and the lighting too is, uh, is, it's very, this is going to be the sexiest edition of the high stakes fantasy football uh, hour tonight. And yes, Kevin Williamson, who I'll see tomorrow, I'm assuming here, the bourbon city baller himself, the beard remains. Um, let's get to, to know you, Brian, before we get into the fantasy football aspect of it. Can you tell us how you're spending your time, what you're doing for a living when you're not winning all these FFPC titles? <laughs> 
Sure. Uh, I'm a CPA. I work for a company called App Properties, a brokerage firm over here in, the, in Chicago. So you might know it um, from your neck of the woods up in Wisconsin up there, too. Um, yep. so yeah, I'm an accountant. So, uh, you know, I like numbers and all this kind of stuff. And it, it's kind of a natural fit with the fantasy football. So, yeah, we live in the western suburbs with my wife. I got two daughters, five and two, almost two. So keeps me busy. Um, so I'm still <laughs> trying to do drafts here when I can. So. <laughs> Uh, that's awesome and great to hear. We get there's a long storied history of CPAs coming on this show, and and uh, and they all are, are pretty successful fantasy football players to the surprise of no one. Um, let's let's get into this uh, tonight. A huge drafting weekend in the FFPC. Obviously, I'm going to be drafting live at the KFFSC this weekend. Um, I look at a lot of different storylines that we'll be breaking down tonight. I'll lead things off with with the Bengals situation, right? Um, Chase Brown and Zach Moss in, in a backfield that featured Zach Moss being drafted first, um, I would say, through, throughout the course of the majority of drafting season. And I would say about a month or so ago, Chase Brown kind of overtook him, and he's still ahead of him in, in ADP right now. Do you have a feeling on which way you'd be going in the majority of your drafts uh, when you decide to go with the Bengals running back? Is it usually Chase Brown or is it usually Zach Moss? Yeah, it's actually a good question to start with since I'm actually a Bengals fan. So this is something that I've kind of been paying attention to, pay attention to all offseason. Um, I'm definitely on the Chase Brown side of things. Um, I think he's more explosive and he'll be probably used out of the backfield, catching passes. I think the offense um, is really going to run through Burrow in the passing game. And I think I think Brown just kind of fits what they want to do. Um, I, at the same time, I think Moss will still have value. He's still going to have a good role here because I don't think Brown's like a – you know, a, a feature guy that they're going to ride, you know, all season long. So um, I'm, I'm open to taking both, but I definitely liked uh, like Chase Brown a, a little bit more and would, I'm targeting him in drafts for sure. Is it just the youth aspect with Chase Brown or, 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 you know, what is it that's more attractive to you about Brown rather than Moss? Yeah. I mean, that's really it. I, that's kind of the way I draft. I'm more aggressive and, you know, like I said, I think Moss is fine. We kind of know what he is at this point. He's He's been a solid, like, number two back for most of his career. He did a nice job in Indy last year when Taylor went down. And I think he can still produce, you know, if called upon. But I just, again, I feel like, again, being a fan, too, of the Bengals, I, you know, from what I hear, they love Brown. And they really want to make him a pretty big part of the offense this year. And that's one of the reasons why they were comfortable getting rid of Nixon and signing Moss on a cheap contract. So, When you talk about and let let's keep the the conversation with running backs going, um, DeAndre Swift in 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 Chicago. Now you're you're a Bengals fan, as you said, but I know you follow the Bears. Can you let us into what we should be expecting from DeAndre Swift as fantasy owners this year? Yeah, I, I, I do like Swift. I'm actually a Georgia grad too, so I've been following Swift for a long time. I've been a big fan of his since he came in the league and kind of saw what hat what can happen with him in Philly last year when he stays healthy and, and gets the touches um, and gets the ball in space and can make plays. So it seems to me that they weren't really happy with what they had. You know, you, I've heard, I don't know, it seems like there's maybe Herbert's on the outs there. Uh, they have, you know, Roshan Johnson yeah. they brought in last year. He seems like a solid guy, but I think um, Swift is the most talented guy there um, and definitely the guy they're going to want to get the ball and then the passing game too. Same, you know, guy that's going to catch a lot of receptions, um, and given the contract I gave him, I think he's, he looks like he's going to be the lead guy there. Sorry, I think I faded in and out. Do you have me now, Brian? I'm sorry. Yeah, I've got you. Okay, cool. Um, Running back situation. I just got done with the KFFSC auction before the show tonight, um, and I was kind of curious to see what happened with Jordan Mason and Elijah Mitchell. Neither mm -hmm. one of them really separated too much, um, uh, you know. In in the auction, they, they both went just for a couple of bucks each. Do you think there's value in in drafting one of those guys this year? And if so, which is the guy that you'd be wanting to look at more than the other one? Yeah, I think it's close. Uh, I'm leaning more Mason lately, but I have taken Mitchell as well. I think they're both worth, you know, they're both going so late. It's worth taking a stab at either one just because if if McCaffrey does have injury issues like he had a couple of years ago, I mean, somebody's going to come into a, a, a obviously great offense. Uh, I My gut tells me that it'll be somewhat of a committee if McCaffrey goes out, but um, 
I would I would lean towards Mason. I think I think he's a little more talented and Mitchell seems like he's had trouble staying on the field, but it sounds like honestly, like all the guys there are already kind of banged yeah. up. But yeah. Uh, so it could be kind of a mess. But I, I would that one's always kind of tricky to figure out that backfield after McCaffrey. But I think I, I would lean towards Mason. That's why so and, and so let's because McCaffrey's already hurt, obviously, as you alluded to. Um and and I wonder um if it is a committee, if McCaffrey does not play, right? Um, is it enough of a non-committee, for lack of a better term, uh, where Jordan Mason could you could start him that week, or would would they kind of would him and Mitchell and cannibalize each other? Where neither one, I mean, they're both basically borderline flexes because uh, you know it'd be like 60-40 or fifty-fifty. Yeah, I mean that's that's a tricky one. I, I probably it sounds like they want Mason to kind of be the number two guy there. They're giving him every opportunity, so um, you know it's 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 kind of a guess, but I'd say maybe a 60, 40 with him and Mitchell, if, if McCaffrey went out um, where, you know, again, they, they're, they're going to be a run heavy team. Uh, we know they're one of the lowest pass volume teams in the league. So they're going to lean on the run, no matter who's, you know, no matter who's healthy, they're always, they always produce. It seems like they can pretty much throw any guy in there and he'll produce pretty good numbers. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I think, I think Mason could step into a nice role there if McCaffrey went down. Sticking in the same division, Brian, um, and we'll get into Cooper Cup later on in the show, but yeah. I think that this has been kind of fascinating. Um, this When we opened up drafts in the FFPC in January, Puka Nakua was like a slam dunk first round pick. I mean, he was going at the back end of the first round in just about every draft. Um, and then even before he got, well, I shouldn't say before he got hurt, but he got hurt and he slipped a little bit. And there were still whispers, uh, not even whispers, but like, beat reporters saying that, you know, Cooper Cup looks all the way back. He looks as good as he's ever uh, has. Uh, Sean McVay saying that they – or I think it was Sean Mc, – I could be wrong. Don't quote me on this. Um, I think it was Sean McVay or one of the coaches saying that they want to run the offense, you know, through Cooper Cup, and it looks like that's how the offense is going to be run through Cup. So it, considering all this, now we look at the Nakua injury and the sort of reemergence of Cooper Cup – they're basically only separated by eight picks in ADP in the Fantasy Pros Championship, which shout out to FantasyMojo.com. Garen Armani, who's here in Kentucky. I talked with him uh, earlier tonight, a couple hours ago. He's going to be drafting this weekend. He's also uh, the man to check with everything, uh, stack finding, uh, waiver wire bids, ADP with the FFPC over at FantasyMojo.com. Make sure you get a subscription to that. If you are playing in the FFPC, it is invaluable. So according to him, uh, yeah, 204 and 212 right now, eight picks separate these two guys. I'm starting to come around to Cooper Cup. Um, how do, how have you been treating this situation? How would you be treating it if you're drafting this weekend, if you're drafting a Rams receiver? Um, it's going to be tough to get both of these guys. Do you like one better than the other at this point? Uh, I would say, you know, I've been more on Cup. It seems like the ADPs are really starting to uh, – you know, consolidate a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, actually, the first FFPC draft I did this year was a slow draft, and I got the 12th, 12th pick, and I took Nakua on the turn before his injury. So I did. I, I am high on him this year. Sounds like it's not a very serious, you know, injury where they're expecting him back week one. Um, I like both, honestly, and that may be the easy way out. But I'll. And I think that's going to be a really consolidated passing game running through both those guys. But to your point, I have heard this the same thing about you know. You know, Cooper Cup, they're going to run the offense through him again. He was, it sounds like he was really hurt last year and just yeah. never was right. And yeah, I was targeting him when he was more of a, of a third round ADP. Yeah, I took him a few times and I really like that. I'm still on him, you know, at the 212. I would still take him at that spot. Absolutely. I think, I think the Rams offense consistently produces, you know, league winning type players. You saw what happened with Kyron last year and Puka, you know, mm -hmm. and obviously they were, they were guys that you got super late in the draft, but even early in the, in the draft, I think that's one of the best offenses you can be, you know, invest in, in fantasy with Sean McVay there. Um, and it's highly concentrated as well. So again, it might be the easy way out, but I, I'm I like both. So even, even with Nakua going ahead of cup, you would still be willing to take him at the two Oh four right now. I think so. Yeah. And then if, if you're doing, you know, I do enough drafts where I feel like I want exposure to both. Right. You know, if you told me like I only had one league, and you know, I I would probably take Cooper Cup heads up over over Pukunakua. I think he'll have a better year. I want to go back to the Niners here because until this Brandon Ayuk situation gets resolved, we're still going to keep talking about it. Um, late last night there was news, and I don't know who reported it, saying that all of a sudden the Commanders were back in the in the running to acquire Ayuk. 
Um, I, in this auction tonight, I thought I might get a deal on him. And I don't know why I thought that <laughs> because I keep waiting for him to fall in drafts and it just hasn't happened this year. It just has not happened. Um, I feel like he should be going um, uh, uh, later than he actually is because of everything that's going on, because of all this training camp that he's missing. And he's not, and once again, nobody got a deal on him tonight. I, I feel like he went, he went around right where he should for how much he should have gone. And I would expect that this weekend as the drafts continue here, he's probably going to be going at the same spot. So I don't, I think anybody who's looking for a deal on Ayuk, you're just not going to find it. What's the best piece of advice you can give FFPC players on how to handle Brandon Ayuk right now, knowing that, you know, you're kind of still paying sticker price for him. Yeah. I mean, he went in, I actually got him in one uh, Kentucky draft last week. He went like early fourth in both of the leagues I live drafted last week. So um, I still like him. I mean, it's a risk, but I think he's so talented. And, you know, even if he, you know, you look at the landing spots, you know, Pittsburgh was a potential one. He'd automatically step in as the one there. I know Pickens is there, but there's really not much else. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, even with Terry McLaurin over there in, in, you know, Washington, even if, you know, McLaurin was not part of the trade that would send a to Washington as well he would immediately slot in as the number one guy. I think he's, you know, he's one of the top, top receivers in the league. He doesn't get enough credit for being that elite, you know, X outside receiver. So I think, you know, late third, even early fourth, I think he's worth the risk. I think he's just, he's too good. Um, when you get to that point past that mid third into the early fourth, I'm, I'm still, I'm still taking him um, at that spot. Uh, yeah, and I should bring this up too. Our good buddy Permar ninety nine in the chat. Uh, go dogs uh, for you, Brian. You are a Georgia fan, right? I am. I'm a Georgia alum. So, oh, you're a Georgia, Georgia alum. Oh my I god, am. taking this a further. Yeah, so, yeah. I went to Georgia. So. There you go. It, that's got to be fun too. When when you um, you know, obviously the success that Georgia's had this last half decade or whatever, and then to see these guys go on into the pros and then drafting them too. And watching them crush it for you on Sundays. What a what a time to be a Georgia fan or an alum in your case as well. Yeah, it was a long wait. So we're finally enjoying, <laughs> you know, the, the the finally the results we've been hoping for for you know 20 years since I graduated from college. So uh yeah, it's been a lot of fun. We might have a, a Georgia question or two, or at least a question yeah. or two on some Georgia players too coming up tonight yeah. as well. Um, New England wide receivers. I it again, I, I normally I do this show. Um, and then I do the auction on Friday, um, but the auction was earlier and I'm doing the show. So I feel like I'm because the auction's fresh in my mind. I keep coming back to it later on in the draft I, or in the auction. I was looking for, um, you know, just some upside of receiver. No New England receivers had been bought yet. I nominated Demario Douglas for a dollar. Um, I, I don't know how I feel about it. I don't know how I should be treating the Patriots receivers. I know I don't want Javon Baker. I mean, the reports on him have been not great, Bob, uh, this weekend. So. I, Douglas is interesting. Polk is interesting. Um, what? Who's your favorite Patriots receiver to be drafting right now? Yeah, it seems like Douglas goes first out of those guys, and he pro he probably get um, my vote there. I just think they're again they're all cheap, but he was there last year. It seems like they like him. He pretty he did pretty well given how horrible their offense was last year, and it should it's like you know it can't get any worse this year with the Patriots. So. You know, the belt, the old regime is gone. There's no more Matt Patricia offensive coordinator or anything crazy like that anymore. Um, I, I've heard the same things about Baker. He seems like maybe a guy, maybe you hear something positive midway through the year and you pick him up on waivers and he's one of those guys that has like a run towards the end of the year. But mm -hmm. yeah, and Polk too, you know, it sounds like he's going to, he's going to get a lot of reps early on. So none of them really excite me that much. I'm kind of in agreement with you there. Um, but if I had to pick one, I would, I would say Douglas, he's probably the best shot for some value. You can, he's a guy you can probably, when you get, you get to buy weeks, you can put it in there and he's going to get some targets every week and get some receptions and, and, and give you a nice floor um, every week. Once you get to the injury and bye week time of the season, you know, so. is that all we can expect from new England receivers this year, just at bye week fill-ins at best? I, that's, that's the way I see it. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. And one of those guys you kind know, of takes over. I just don't see like the, you know, the prototype alpha player, you know, yeah. receiver coming out this year. It doesn't seem like it to me. Maybe when Drake may comes in, you know, second half of the year, he's, he has a good connection with one of those guys and just kind of feeds and targets. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I still think, you know, especially with Douglas and Polk early on in the season, they're certainly worth drafting and stashing there for once you get to, you know, the bye weeks and maybe down the run, maybe down the stretch, one of those guys, you know, makes a run with uh you know quarterback change 
Uh, we got a question from uh, Trevor Holt, who's going to be drafting in the Kentucky Fantasy Football State Championship this weekend. Carson Steele, the running back two in Kansas City. Now, anytime I hear the the, the name Carson Steele, the first thing I automatically think of is um, we have been burned and hurt by Clyde <laughs> Edwards Alaire so much. We are looking for any reason to draft any other Chiefs backup running back, right? And I think that's a, a huge part of it. Now, he's been very good in the preseason. But from what I've been seeing, it's it's not usually been with the ones or, or even the twos. It's been a lot with the threes, uh, some with the twos. But I think that if, if I had to draft a, a Chiefs backup running back, and I considered this in the auction, it was still going to be Edwards Alaire over Steele. And I would probably take Steele over Daenerys Prince at this point. But I think it's still CEH for me. Um, what do you think about Carson Steele? How, how likely is it that he'd end up on any of your teams going forward in these last two weeks before the season starts, Brian? Yeah, you know, I haven't drafted him yet, and uh, I am pretty heavily invested in Pacheco. So I, I I have drafted more of Prince early on in the draft season. I have not drafted Clyde edwards Hilaire. Like, to your point, I I just feel like if something were to happen to Pacheco, he's not going to get, you know, they've tried, the, tried it with him before. It just has never worked. There's enough other talent with Prince and Steele. And to your question on Steele, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I've seen him start to go towards the end of drafts that I've been in. And he looks good. He's, he's kind yeah. of, a, you know, one of those talent, just talented guys. And, you know, Pacheco came in there as a seventh rounder and unseated Herbert Solaire. So, I can, you know, even though, you know, Steele's an undrafted free agent, if he looks good and he's he's athletic and physical and, you know, why not? I mean, Edward Solaire has kind of shown us he's kind of just a guy at this point. So, um, I, yeah, I would I would probably take, honestly, Edward Solaire last of the three at this point. For me, maybe, maybe I'm just getting, I've just gotten burned too many times, right. but yeah, he'd probably be at the bottom for me right now. You have CEH PTSD yeah. essentially yeah. is what it yeah. is. <laughs> um, be a good team name this year too. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, and I totally get it too. I mean, we're, we're obviously hunting for upside and, and um, I know we want to draft the backup, but at the same time, um, we have seen what Edwards Alaire can do for us and it hasn't been a ton. <laughs> what we haven't seen is Carson Steele and what we haven't seen is him uh, out on the uh, out on the field in a real live NFL game? So we don't know how yeah. he would do. He could be great. He could be very very good. We know what Edwards Alaire is. We don't know what Steele is, and I think that's what's intriguing about taking Steele here uh, as well. Um, yeah. Moving on here, um, contractually obligated. I always make this joke. Um, we're uh, FFPC podcast. FFPC's tight end premium, and I have to ask you about Kyle Pitts. We have to talk about Kyle Pitts. He is the most polarizing guy year in and year out every year in the NFL. Is this going to be his year where he achieves greatness, where he captures um, all the um, the accolades, the stats, everything that um, the, the Kyle Pitts truthers have been expecting since he came into the league from Florida? Is this going to be the year? No Arthur Smith, uh, brand new offensive coordinator, and not one but two, it appears, real quarterbacks in Atlanta to get him the ball. How do you feel about Kyle Pitts? How have you been drafting him this year? Uh, yes, I believe this is finally the year. I am definitely targeting him. At, you know, when when the the price is right for sure, um, he definitely isn't right at the towards the top of the tight ends for me. To your point, Arthur Smith is gone. You know, I don't know. And again, I'm I'm an Atlanta native, so I do watch some Falcons football. And like the last couple of years, like I don't know, if people may know, but Desmond Ritter and Marcus Mariota were just absolutely awful. At yes. I mean, they were awful. <laughs> I mean, beyond below replacement level. I mean, and now you put in Cousins, and yeah, he's coming off an Achilles. But to your point, they drafted Penix, who I think is a talented passer. You know, I watched him play a good bit in college last year. and He can throw the ball. And so I think if you needed him to step in and just get the ball to Pitts, get it to London, get it to Bijan, he can do that. Um, so I think I think this is final year. So I think it's it's a good year to be aggressively drafting pits. Yeah, and and I I was I was aggressive in bidding on him tonight. Mm -hmm. I ultimately lost out on him, and I was fine with it. I ended up getting Trey McBride instead, so I'm cool with it. Um, but yeah, I, I think I'm probably going to be drafting him a couple of times yeah. this weekend for sure. Uh, the Bourbon City Baller Kevin Williamson. Uh, after the first six quarterbacks are gone, he's in the YouTube chat right now. Um, who would you take between Kyler Murray, Jordan Love, Joe Burrow, Dak Prescott? That's the order um, according to Fantasy Pros ADP after the top six. Murray, Love, Burrow, Prescott. I have my order, but Brian, I'm going to ask you yours first. Sure. Um, I would probably go um, right now. I would say Love would be first. I just I really like the passing. He's got so many weapons. Like mm -hmm. even if a guy goes down, it's like they're four deep, at four maybe five deep with Bo Melton at receiver. They're two deep at tight end. Um, I think. 
they're going to looks like they're going to you know open that offense up like they did the second half of last year. So I put him first. I'd probably go Murray second just because of the rushing ability. Um, you know, I like obviously Marvin Harrison's there now. He's got Trey McBride, uh, Michael Wilson, and Greg Dortch seem like they're good secondary players. Um, so there's a decently deep receiving core there, plus the rushing upside. Mm-hmm. I, I like the coaching staff there. It seems like they have a good plan for what they want to do. They kind of overachieved last year. Um, and I would probably put my uh, my my Bengal Joe Burrow next. Um, a little worried with all the <laughs> the receivers upset about their contracts, but you know right. he's got two really good ones with Chase and uh, and Higgins. There is, I think there is some downside there if things were to get ugly with the receivers. But um, I think he's just he's back healthy. He's had a full off season. Um, he's and he, he's just a, he's really good when he's healthy. You know, if you look at the, the games he's played healthy, he's one of the top guys in the league. So doesn't have the rushing upside of like a Murray, but I'd probably slot him in there next. And then probably be last will be Dak. Um, you know, if, if CD lands out there, which we, I think we all expect him to be at some point They're they're crazy. If they don't get that contract done, then um, that's enough for him to put up a solid year with Ferguson and some right. they have there. I just don't know if the upside is, is quite there with um, the lack of the running game and um some of the other issues in Dallas right now. So that's probably my order right there. It's all fairly close though. I think in that yeah. range. Um, I agree with you that it's close except for one player. Here's my four. To me, it's Kyler Murray first, and then I'm going to take the other three as sort of like a kind of a glut together. And the reason is um, of these four guys, I think Kyler Murray has the biggest advantage in rushing in getting outside the pocket, creating plays with his legs. And I think that that it, I don't know what it is. This year especially, I'm really targeting running quarterbacks because I just think it's it, it gives you more of an advantage to 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 do it that way uh, with a single quarterback start. Um, so I would put Murray first. If this is weird. You're a Bengals guy. You put Love ab- above Burrow. I'm a Packers guy. I think I'm going to put Burrow above <laughs> Love, uh, which is bizarre. Now, initially, I'm, and I still kind of am worried about how things are going to go um, in Cincinnati this year with you know Chase still not there. He's holding in, right? He's at practice. Yeah, he's kind of one of those hold-ins. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, and then, obviously, Higgins, you know, he's not happy to be on the tag, but he's out there practicing. So I, I was getting kind of bad vibes about that, and then I was concerned about the wrist. I'm less concerned about the wrist now on Joe Burrow um, now that I've seen – this is not even a story anymore about, you know, re- recovery from that. So I and, – and another reason I think I put Burrow ahead of love is because I, I think that – I spent most of the offseason last year telling people that I thought Jordan Love was going to be pretty good. I didn't think he was going to be as good as he was at the end of the season. And to that point, I still think Green Bay was punching above its weight uh, the, that last month and a half of the season. And I think because, you know, recency bias is something that plagues us as fantasy football players, uh, I think we remember that as that's the freshest thing in our memory. It wouldn't surprise me at all that, uh, to see Green Bay start the season not at the level they started last season at where people were talking about, Oh my God, love is they got to get rid of them. Um, but I could see them being a little sluggish to start off. And, and I don't necessarily think that's as likely in Cincinnati could happen in Cincinnati. Um, so I put, I, I go, um, I go Murray, I go Burrow, I go love. And then Prescott's a close third of that final three. Um, not because I don't think he can get it done. Um, I think he's a really good fantasy quarterback. I just, the whole situation there with Jones and and Lamb and Prescott, I just try to think about what that's going to be like to to be in that locker room and to play out the season with that. And I don't know if CeeDee Lamb is going to be more at risk to soft tissue injuries since he's missed all this training camp time too. So I get some bad vibes there as well. So I'm going to go, so so ADP is, to answer your question, Kevin, uh, ADP is Murray Love Burrow Prescott. Brian is saying, um, love, uh, excuse me, love Murray Burrow Prescott, right? Yeah, and then I have it, um, Murray Burrow Love Prescott. So, the basic gist of this is everybody hates Prescott in, in this <laughs> scenario. That's that's what we figured out for this. Um, and Permar 99 loves, 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 loves Joe Burrow out of that four. Uh, he says he's the man easily there. So, that's good that Permar is uh, is uh, a believer in Joe Burrow this year for your Bengals. Let's uh, uh, stay in the state of Ohio here and talk about the Cleveland Browns. I um, didn't want to have to do it, and thank God it didn't come to it, <laughs> but I almost had to buy Deshaun Watson as my backup quarterback in, in t- tonight or this afternoon's auction. Um, 
I, I don't – he's a guy I guess I'd be okay with as my backup, but I wouldn't feel great about it. Should I, though? I mean, Amari Cooper, they get Jerry Judy, and Joku looked really good last year. Don't forget about Elijah Moore. A couple of talented pass catchers coming out of the backfield that are healthy right now, and Deontay Foreman and, and Jerome Ford. Am I a little bit too bearish on Deshaun Watson? Should I actually like him a little bit more than just I'm okay with him kind of as my backup, Brian? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I look at the guys where he's in the range where he's going, and I think if you look at like, you know, upside wise where he's getting drafted, he's probably got the most of you know the guys where he's going. Um, and uh, yeah, I've taken I actually have taken him a lot as my backup quarterback. Uh, I think he pairs up really nice with like a you know like a Prescott or a Burrow, a guy that's like you know the the safe guy that might not have quite as much up rushing upside as some of those other players and. Um, it's 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 a little bit of a risk because I think it's kind of do or die this year for him. It, it's but I think it's one of those things. You know, if he flops where you're drafting him right now, you can just get rid of him and pick somebody else up, and it's it's a low risk move uh, with a lot of upside there. And then you can always pick up you know one of those guys that's usually an air. Even you might see like an Aaron Rodgers or a Kirk Cousins or somebody like that on waivers at some point. You know, right. you can pick up. So yeah, I'm I'm drafting him just for the pure upside as as a backup. I'm you know, unless unless I'm. I might not pair him with, say, like a Jaden Daniels, like a more upside-oriented starter. I might look at like that and say, all right, maybe let me pair him with like a Kirk Cousins or something like that. Okay. Right. Yeah, I think Deshaun's a good guy. If you're just shooting for the moon and just saying, hey, what guy back here can finish in the top five if everything goes right, I think it's him because of the way they're looking to run that offense. They want to throw the ball this year. They built the team to throw the ball. They have a great, o- a good O-line. Um, they're, they should be a pretty good team this year. And uh, I think – if everything comes together, you know, I don't know if we'll ever see the Deshaun Watson of, you know, whatever, three or four years ago, but right. I think there's still the upside there, but this will probably be the last, the last chance. If we don't see it this year, that's probably, it's probably never coming back. So. It, the other thing, and I didn't consider this till now, but Cleveland's got a really good defense too. And I think their offensive, I think you were right. The first time you said, it, I think their offensive line is great. Um, yeah. and, and I think about their defense and how good that uh, unit could be this year. That could actually hurt Watson, right? You know, if it's like if they're playing, if they're playing good defense, maybe Ford and, and Foreman stand out, and that and that could take the pressure off Watson, and he could be more efficient then, and maybe it's better for him. And now we're in the time as a flat circle, and we're in a constant loop of trying to figure out, you know, like what's best for for Watson this year. Um, but you know, you're right. I I, I think uh, I think I feel a little bit uh, better about uh, Watson now that you bring this up. Uh, Permar is just going off in the chat about Jordan Mason right now. He did get the start tonight. Now, Elijah Mitchell just came back from injury this week, so I'm sure that had something to do with it. But Jordan Mason targeted once. He did not catch it. I don't know if it was a bad pass or not, but five carries, 30 yards, and a touchdown already on the night for Jordan Mason. That touchdown, I'm trying to see, it was a four-yard run. So there you go. Right. Mason is looking good tonight. Uh, a couple of emails here for you, Brian. Uh, sure. Let's get into it. Brandy in Boston will lead things off. Hi, Brian. How concerned are you about Ray Davis taking away catches and touchdowns from James Cook this season. Thanks so much. That is Randy in Boston. Thanks for the email, Randy. Um, I don't know. Have you have been drafting a lot of James Cook this year? How, how do you feel about that Bills running back situation? Yeah, I like Cook. Uh, you know, he's, he's he's going most of the time, uh, like fourth round. I even got him in one FFPC in the fifth round after I started four wide receivers. So I'll take mm, that all day. Yep. Um, I think Davis will definitely have a role. It sounds like he's looked good. He's a good player. But I don't know if, you know, James Cook was really, really good last year. And speaking of another Georgia guy that I watched, you know, back from when he was a, a freshman at Georgia, he's he's a really good player. And, you know, the biggest threat for me is just Josh Allen. You know, Josh Allen taking all those wow. rushing touchdowns. You know, is he going to be a guy that gets 10 rushing touchdowns? Probably not. But, you know, looking with Stephon Diggs being gone, they kind of have like a wide receiver com- you know, committee situation going there. I think they're going to run a lot of the two tight end sets with – to get Kincaid and Knox in the field. And I think, I think things are setting up for Cook to have a really good year. So, so Ray Davis is more of just like an injury away type guy. You don't really yeah. see him having a big role in this, in this backfield, right? I mean, you look at what they tried to do with like the Tavius Murray and those other, was it uh, Ty Johnson, I think. I mean, okay. I think they want that second guy that can, you know, come in and take, you know, 35, 40% of the snaps is what okay. I would guess. But yeah, you look at what Brady did. You know, Joe Brady, the offensive coordinator, did last year. Um, and you've talked about, you know, recency bias, but towards the second half of the year, once once Dorsey was fired and Brady took over, Cook kind of took off. And yeah, again, the, the only real knock on him I see is the rushing touchdowns, but you can get him in the fourth or fifth round. So that's kind of already worked into his price. So 
I think he's a great guy to target after if you start wide receiver heavy. He's a perfect guy to target in the fourth and fifth round. Um, and, and and to your point, if he's your number one running back after going four straight receivers, I think you're doing it the right way. I mean, yeah, I really that like point, that, that draft that, that, started that way. Yeah. Um, and and you know, Josh, what's your feeling on Josh Allen? I just I get this vibe that he's not going to be as running as much as he used to, and and I don't think that Buffalo is going to expose him to stuff around the goal line as much as they used to, which I think could be working in James Cook's favor. It certainly could, even if you took, you know, what did Allen have, like 12 rushing touchdowns or something crazy last year? Yeah, know? it was high. It was high. Even if you gave Cook, you know, two or three of those, that that helps a little bit. I don't know. I mean, Allen seems like the type of guy that when he wants to run it, he's going to run it. You know, I know they probably want to try to keep him healthy for the, the playoff games against, you know, Kansas City, Cincinnati, Baltimore. But he seems like the type of guy that's just going to – he's going to sometimes just – do his own thing um, a little bit. So, um, but it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't really scare me off too much on Cook. No, I think he's going to have a really good year. Uh, one more email here that we'll get to. Um, Russ in Tulsa. Do you prefer Austin Eckler or Brian Robinson in the commander's backfield this year? Eckler or Robinson? Russ, thank you for the email out of Tulsa. Do you have a feeling on this? And it's always, I always, I always ask these questions, right. To, to try to be, you know, get you to go one way or the other, but, if you want to say like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't have a feeling. I'm, I'm kind of splitting it down the middle. That's fine too. How are we been treating your, the commanders uh, rushers? No, I won't take the easy way out on this one. I, I'm, I'm on the Robinson, Robinson side of this one for sure. Uh, you know, I think Eckler could be brought in to have a role coming out of the, you know third down in the passing game. Not sure how much he has left in the tank. I mean, he's he's getting up there. He's had a lot of touches in San Diego. He's not a big guy. San Diego, I guess not Los Angeles. He's not a right. big dude. And I, I think Robinson's underrated. I think he's a really good runner. Uh, I'd be, you know, if with Daniels coming in this year, if the offense kind of can take another step um, and put up some more points, you know, move the ball, I think Robinson's going to benefit from that. And he's definitely the guy I'm targeting in that backfield. Do you think that um, that um, Eckler is done? I mean, because I, there's a prevailing thought out there, and I don't say I shouldn't say the prevailing, but there is a thought out there that what we saw from Eckler last year was kind of a precursor of what we're going to see of this year. I myself am not a subscriber to that. I think he's going to have a nice bounce back year, not to the level of him being a, you know, having first round value, but do you think he's kind of washed? And since Farrell's not on the show tonight, I can use that term. Do you think <laughs> Austin Eckler is washed? Um, I, yeah, as a feature back. Yeah. I mean, he might have, like I said, if he, I think he, if you want to get him the ball to the backfield let him make plays in space, I think he can still do that for you. But yeah, I'm not. I'm probably not as bullish as you are on him. Um, and it could burn me. I could be wrong. But this is one where I felt like, all right, they're going pretty pretty close enough. I think in the draft, where you kind of have to pick one. It's not like you can get Robinson and then take Eckler like five rounds later. So right. I, I, I've been in on Robinson. Robinson's the, my my bet uh, for this team this year. Yeah. I and and the thing is too with with I wouldn't even think you'd want both those guys, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> on your team, I mean, unless you're playing in like a closed twelve team league then maybe it makes more sense. But when you're trying to win a million bucks in the main event or the fantasy pros championship, I think that's where you want to diversify a little bit. Um, or, or the, I like, I, I'm telling you, man, I, I think this weekend, I think I have nine drafts or seven drafts <laughs> and two auctions. I bet I get a commander in every one. I, I'm just, I'm really high on that offense this year with Jaden Daniels there in Kingsbury. Um, and Permar talks, talks my ear off, of, uh, or not my ear off, but he's always talking about how excited he is with the commanders this year too. Um, and then they get rid of Dotson, um, which we haven't got into yet. We'll get into that in a second. But they get rid of Dotson, and and then it opens up the door for Zacchaeus and Diami Brown, who you say, well, Balky, who cares? Well, they're going to be meaningful because Jaden Daniels makes them meaningful. That commander's offense, I'm pretty high on, Brian. Are you? Uh, yes, I agree. I'm a, I'm a big Jaden Daniels fan. We talked about that range of quarterbacks earlier, uh, those four guys. I haven't really drafted much in, in that range. I'm either like, you know, the big three or I'm waiting on like a Jaden Daniels trying to target him, even a, maybe a Caleb Williams if I wait too long um, to get like one of the top guys. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of Daniels. He looks like he's a really good player. Uh, yeah. He was great at LSU last year. He was awesome. And, um, yeah, I'm, I've always been a McLaurin fan. I think he's underrated and he's mm -hmm. just had nothing – you know, a quarterback really to play with most of his yeah. career. Um, I'm not a huge Kingsbury guy. I mean, I don't think it's, it's big, but compared to last year, I mean, pretty much anything is an upgrade over what <laughs> kind of happened last year. Right. So um, yeah. And, and it sounds like Dotson was just kind of in the doghouse and they shipped him out and they have kind of a, 
maybe one of those guys will emerge, you know, at, at the number two receiver, but they might have a bit of a, of a mix of a rotation there after McLaurin. So, um, but I am a fan of the offense overall as well. Yeah. And, and to say I'm putting my money where my mouth is, I did buy both McLaurin and Eckler in that mm-hmm. auction tonight. So I already got two commanders on my team. Um, and I'll be, I'm probably going to talk more about that auction team. Everybody's just, I'm almost sick of talking about it, but I <laughs> keep bringing it up. Final question here for you before we get into the news. Um, someone that you've been trying to get uh, on all your teams this year uh, because you're that big of a believer in them, and then a player that you don't think is going to end up on any of your teams, Brian? Uh, there's a couple guys I can name in the first one. I would say one that, like I mentioned earlier, that probably is going to be determined how a lot of my season goes is Pacheco. Like in the third round, I really liked him after like a wide receiver, wide receiver start. I think he's in – I think the, the Chiefs offense is going to bounce back. I mean, they, they were kind of down last year because of the issues at receiver. I think they fixed that with, um, you know, Worthy and then Marquise Brown when he's back healthy. And then obviously it seems like Rasheed Rice is, is might avoid a suspension this year, which will be great for the for that, for the offense. And it sounds like they're ready to give Pacheco a three-down roll. And, you know, we talked about the backups earlier. There's no real threat. You know, yeah. you've got Edward layer who's a disappointment, and then two undrafted guys from the last two years. So I think they're going to give him all they can handle. Um, so he's a guy I'm, I'm, I'm I have a hard time passing on him in the third round if he ever makes it there. I've even taken him late second in drafts too as well. So I'm I'm very bullish on him. Um, for a guy I'm avoiding, it pains me to say because I like him. I think he's a good player. Um, is Pickens George Pickens? Mm. Uh, I just haven't taken him yet. The Arthur Smith thing scares me. Uh, I just I just don't like the slow-paced offense. Tomlin's really conservative. They're going to run the ball a ton there. I think he's going to get a lot of targets and he'll have his big weeks, but uh, I think you're going to – yeah, I could be wrong and that could burn me on if he gets right. 150 targets. You know, and Ayuk a- 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 doesn't end up going there, which it seems like he may stay in San Francisco, but there's just other players in that range where I'm targeting that I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm I just feel better about, you know, the way I build my teams and – for some reason, Pickens, I just haven't fit him in yet. Um, and I just, he's not really a guy I'm targeting this year, unfortunately. Um, let's go to uh, Permar99 uh, chiming in. And this is something that I think is worth bringing up. He wants to know if the rumors are true that Audric <laughs> Estime is going to be the starter in Denver and the Broncos are going to trade Javante Williams to Dallas. I've played fantasy football and followed the mm-hmm. NFL long enough to say, um to to not say well there's no way that could happen yeah. you know because crazy stuff like that yeah. does happen and yeah i mean it, it it would surprise me if that happens it wouldn't shock me if that happens but my approach this weekend i'm approaching it as if javante williams and audrick Estime are going to be in the same backfield as jaleel mclaughlin in denver and i'm treating rico dowdle and ezekiel elliott as the running backs that to, to to draft in in dallas that's how i'm doing it now that again to borrow a phrase from you, it could burn me, but I think that that's the way I, I think you have to approach it, Brian. Uh, yeah, I agree. I think Javante, it sounds like he maybe had some weight issues like in yep. mini camp or something, and he's turned that around. It sounds like he's going to be the guy there. Um, so I'm, I'm in on him. Um, and then you've got Estime and McLaughlin there. I think they'll be in that they'll, that back is going to put up points. And I think Javante is the number one guy there from what I've heard. Um, you know, P Ryan might be the odd man out there. Mm-hmm. And I've heard, um, you know, some rumors of him going back to Cincinnati, which could put a damper on Chase Brown because, um, you know, they don't really have a lot behind him and Zach Moss there. Um, so it's, uh, my, my guess is P. Ryan's the odd man out there. I've heard – I heard the other day Miles Sanders to Dallas. I heard that one. Ooh, you know, if he gets cut, spicy. yeah, I could see, you know, I'd be shocked if Dallas doesn't have a running back. I mean, I, th- I think Zeke is cooked. I mean, in my opinion, he's cooked. Mm-hmm. Very, I have not drafted him yet. I've heard some people like Dowdle. I have not done it yet. I've kind of avoided that backfield because I, I do think they will add a back there. Um, Cause you know, that you see these trades that happen, you know, somebody will throw us, they'll throw a seventh round pick at somebody cause somebody's going to get cut and they can add a body, you know, Cleveland Herbert, Miles yep. Sanders, all these guys. I think somebody like that will end up in Dallas, but like you said, you, you just don't know this. It's kind of the, the <laughs> all these crazy rumors this time of year, you'll see the kind of the running back musical chairs once guys start getting cut. So for anybody who's been following along and drinking every time I bring up a player or we bring up a player that I bought in the auction this afternoon, <laughs> take another one because I got Ezekiel Elliott in that auction yeah. as well. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, it's, it's just crazy how this has worked out. Okay. The um, the um, um, uh, chat room is just 
a buzz with this Dotson trade. That, so yeah. let's, in, in the follow-up from this, so let's get into that. Uh, the Eagles ended up getting Jahan Dotson in a fifth-round pick yesterday from the Commanders in exchange for uh, draft picks, specifically a 2025 20, third, two seventh-round picks. Uh, and this is a guy who apparently in Dotson was playing behind De'Ami Brown and Olamide Zacchaeus, and, and now he's out. Now he's in Philadelphia, probably being the number three receiver there um, because Philadelphia was struggling to find a guy uh, who could be the number three guy there. Um, you know, they tried Paris Campbell. Johnny Wilson was a draft pick for him this year. Um, so now he becomes probably the number three receiver there. Uh, let's just go into the um, into the chat, and, and we'll talk about, you know, we'll, we'll get it right from the horse's mouth. <laughs> Scott Hoyt, uh, who uh, says, does the trade of Dotson impact the running game? I think teams will focus on McLaurin opening the running game a bit. Do you think that's uh, a valid point here, Brian? Yeah, I mean, I could see that happening. Um, I, I think McLaurin was already the, the alpha there and was going to be the, the, you know, the target monster in that offense. And, you know, Dotson had a pretty good rookie year. It's, it's kind of surprising to see him, you know, kind of fall out of, out of favor like this. But it was a prior regime that drafted him. Um, and, yeah, I think I think they have enough with the other guys you mentioned. Plus, I, I honestly – I like Luke McCaffrey. I've heard some good things about him where he can have a role at some point this year. They were using him out of the backfield some, so they might have some things, you know, some some packages for him as well. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm bullish on the running game with Brian Robinson there, so it certainly could help. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Dominic is Eddie kind of chiming in on the same point. There's something to be said about abandoned wide receiver targets with some of them going to the running back. Now I think some of them will go to Eckler, but maybe Brian Robinson gets a boost in, in pass catching here as well. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I, he's a pretty good receiver. I remember I watched a lot of him at Bama because you know he played. You know, I watched a lot of SEC football, and he was a good player. Mm -hmm. He was kind of, kind of always the unsung hero there. He wasn't like some of the freak, like a freakish talent, like some of those other backs that he was there with, like Najee Harris and some of those other guys that were bigger names. Mm -hmm. But he was always a really good player there, and I remember him being a good receiver as well. So I think he can absolutely do it. So, um, you know, look at what James Conner did with you know Cliff Kingsbury back in Arizona. He could certainly. If he wants to feed Robinson, I think he can absolutely do it. So that, again, that's one of the reasons why I am high on him this year. So um, the the other thing, and Permar brings this up too, and and I did hear this as well. What happens if Devonta Smith is in the slot? Jahan Dotson is on the outside. Then don't we have to be moving Devonta Smith up our draft boards if he's playing there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it seems like with Kellen Moore, they're going to do a lot of more of moving Brown and Smith around. So I think that's. That's a positive for both of them. Yeah, I'm 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 very bullish on the uh, on those guys as well. I think they're in for a bounce back year. Um, there's definitely opportunity there with Dotson too. I mean, they have a pretty concentrated passing game with the two top guys and 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 Goddard. And I think I think I think Dotson's a pretty good player. Which is, again, mm -hmm. I think he could step in if something were to happen to one of those guys. Um, and if he does get more reps, if he gets starts playing outside and gets in the in the rotation, I think he's definitely a guy that. Um, I actually, I like him better probably, honestly, in Philly now than I would have been in staying in Washington at this point. Yeah, yeah. And, and, that, and that's the thing. I didn't realize that um, he had fallen behind not one but two of those guys, yeah. you know. So this might just be one of those things that, you know, we often hear it in baseball, just change the scenery, and maybe yeah. that helps Dotson uh, for sure. Yeah, but I, I love uh, Smith this year. I think he's going to have a really good year. I, yeah. I do too. I, I, I think um, I was kind of on Smith before this, and now it's mm -hmm. like, okay, this is a guy I, I really need to take mm -hmm. a hard look at uh, in my drafts going forward early on. Uh, let's go to Carolina. Head coach Dave Canales said he wants Bryce Young and the starters to get some work tomorrow uh, against the Buffalo Bills, and it sounds like um, – uh, in in the final game before the regular season, we could see a lot of Bryce Young, and I think we want to see a lot of Bryce Young because the offense that he is in this year is radically different than the one that he was in last year. Considering that he's got a new head coach, a new offensive coordinator, and he's got Jonathan Brooks, and he's got Xavier Leggett, and he's got Deontay Johnson, and he's got Jatavian Sanders. You know, he's got all and a better offensive line too. So I think Carolina really learned their lesson last year. You can't just draft the number one pick, not surround him with anything, and expect him to do well. Um, it's a lesson that I think that Chicago knew uh, because they all they did was surround Caleb Williams with talent this coming year. So we want to see Bryce Young. We want to see the Panthers improve. Um, I'm very curious to see how some of these younger guys do. I know Jonathan Mingo uh, had made a couple of headlines this summer as well. I know the corpse of Adam Thielen is still getting it done there. <laughs> Anybody in Carolina you're excited about this year, um, hopefully in a much better season for 2024 than 2023? Yeah, I don't think it can get much worse than last year, obviously. <laughs> it was pretty bad. It was kind of like New England. It's just horrible. I, I haven't drafted a Panther yet. I haven't. Just I, I can't 
make myself do it. I, I think Deontay Johnson's a good player. I just, again, I'm a pretty aggressive drafter. I tend to avoid bad offenses or the offense I think would be bad. I, I know Canal- Canalis has done wonders with Geno and then Baker. So again, maybe I'm, maybe I'm, I'm selling them short and they'll, they'll, I, I just don't see them being, you know, anything more than like a bot, still a bottom 10 offense with that talent. Um, mm-hmm. Maybe Brooks comes back and gives them some juice in the second half of the year. But for me, no, I haven't really gotten excited yet. So I haven't, I can't really say I'm, I'm, I'm drafting Panthers this year. Yeah. I mean, I, I would look, Brooks is an interesting guy because I, I, I could see the talent there. My concern is, I don't I don't get to use him as a starter until like week six. And then I could see a season of, hey, he's healthy, he looks good, and yet the results aren't there after yeah. that torn ACL. And then he's he's a much better player for 2025. That's my concern with him. Um Deontay Johnson, I'm I'm still taking I'm I'm gonna take advantage of, although he went the bidding was fast and furious on him this afternoon. So I don't know if I'm going to be getting him in any drafts that everybody feels the same way I do about him. Other than that, I'm, I'm kind of, as far as redraft goes, no one Mingo, no one Leggett, no one Sanders. It's just no one Thielen. Um, it, I, I think that it, it it's either Brooks or Johnson for me. And I don't know if I'm going to get him uh, based on yeah. how everybody was it, aggressively bidding this afternoon. Yeah. With Brooks. I mean, I know that Rashad, Rashad white had a really good year with canals last year. So I could see that second half of the year, but to your point, like you wait the whole year and then it's like, you know, I think he's like an eighth round pick in FFPC right yeah. now. If I'm yeah. Correct. So there's a lot of other guys I like. That's like, you're taking him over like a Brian Robinson. Or something like that. I'm just, I'm not going to do that at this point. Yeah. Maybe again, maybe it burns me, like I said, but um yeah, not not uh, haven't invested too heavily in Carolina. Can't yeah, I, and 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 I'll say this, and and Permar is right. I mean, he Brooks could be a league winner. I mean, I've heard that from mm-hmm. from numerous fantasy analysts that it could happen. It's not like I'm going to avoid him totally. Um, I just don't know if I'm going to be able to get him at a spot where I'm comfortable. Get I'll pay sticker in, in the eighth round for him. Um, but if he goes much higher than that, I, I just I don't want roster cloggers on my team to, yeah. to start off the season. I just, I don't like that. My guys, I, I know players are going to get hurt. Like yeah. I don't want to draft guys that are already hurt yeah, or exactly. already rehabbing coming in. Um, Bill's head coach, Sean McDermott said, Curtis Samuel could actually play week one against Arizona. Said there's a chance that Marquez Valdez Scantling could uh, be healthy in time for week one. Uh, but both situations are murky right now. Turf toe scares me. Turf toe is not something that all of a sudden you just be arrested for a couple of weeks and you're good to go. Uh, maybe Samuel is recovered and he plays week one and we don't hear about this again, but I'm very skeptical about that. So to that point, how concerned are you with Curtis Samuel's turf toe right now? And if it is um, significant, who do you like better, Keon Coleman or Khalil Shakir? Um, I actually did hear that it's possible Samuel might have not had tur- like a, a turf toe or it might have been something else, but um, it sounds like there's more positivity around him. He's, he's a good player. Um, yeah, a solid player. I'm not – I drafted him, not like aggressively targeting him. Um, I would like to – I have not really gotten much Shakir yet, and I think I do want to get more of him. Um, and I think same with Coleman. I think it's going to be tough early in the season to really figure out Again, I, you know, I think it's going to be Kincaid. Honestly, he's going to be the number one receiver there. Uh, I could definitely see, you know, Keon Coleman, he reminds me kind of like a Rasheed Rice, like that big, you know, slot red zone receiver mm-hmm. that maybe isn't an outside guy, but if they put him in that in that, in that that kind of role, he could, you know, score some touchdowns and have like a, a little bit of a, a kind of an emergence middle to the end of the year. Because I don't think, you know, Samuel or Shakir are, you know, alpha receivers. So, um, but – yeah, to your question, I probably would go Shakir right now over mm-hmm. Coleman, but um, I think it's going to be good offense. So I I, I want to get some of, of all those guys to uh, to just increase my chances of hitting on you know if somebody emerges as a one there you know next to Kincaid. Yeah, because they're not they're not expensive. I mean, yeah. you, you can invest in those guys and they yeah. won't kill your draft. And oh, by the way, take a drink. I got Keon Coleman in the auction tonight <laughs> as well. That's, no, that's he's got a lot of talent. I, he's, he's a pretty good player last year at FSU. So. Sean Payton has named Bo Nix the starting quarterback for Denver. Uh, Zach Stevens had this report. Bo Nix has has looked really good. 23 of 30, 205 yards and two touchdowns in two preseason games. He's looked good under pressure. Granted, he's seen a couple of vanilla defenses, one that included a lot of backups in, in Green Bay. But you can't really – I mean, he, he can't control who he's going against, right? He can only go out and execute, which is what he did. Does this give you a little bit more faith in players like Cortland Sutton, Troy uh, Troy Franklin, 
Um, Dulcich, we, we talked about the backfield as, as well. Um, are you bullish on, and Tim Patrick for that, for that matter, are you bullish on, on the Broncos now that uh, Nick's looks capable and we know Nick's is the starter, Brian? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Given some of the quarterback issues there. It's funny because, you know, again, I'm a Georgia fan. So I watched him play for four years at Auburn and he was horrible against Georgia every single year. <laughs> then he transferred to Oregon and then we played Oregon the first game after our first national title. And I think it was like 45 to nothing for pretty much the whole, we absolutely destroyed Oregon. He looked terrible. So I was not a fan of his. And then, yeah. you know, as he went to the kind of the draft process and got drafted with Peyton, you heard like the Drew Brees comparisons, like that kind of that point guard, you know, distributor quarterback. And it seems like he's got, he's got so many starts under his belt and he's looked good. Uh, I think I, I do. Yeah. I think he's going to stabilize that offense and it makes me feel a lot better about um, taking a guy like Sutton a little later. Cause he's not a guy you have to spend a, a high pick on. And he did have a good year a couple of years ago. It's been a while, but if he can stay on the field, there's really, I, I'm not a, I don't know if we're going to see much from Franklin this year. You, you hear a lot about Marvin Mims. He's never really, he's been kind of a fantasy darling, but never really has made a huge impact. Maybe Peyton doesn't really like him that much. I'm not sure. No. Um, I actually did take Dulcich for the first time in a league as a number two tight end uh, recently. So yeah, I do. I, I think it's going to be a good a boon for the whole offense. I, uh, I think that um, now is the time because we only have a few minutes left and I want to get to the hype guy uh, to right. bring everybody into the background of the hype guy. Uh, Dave Gerzak came up with this. Dave Gerzak, my former HSFF or, um, co-host, who you drafted next to in Cincinnati at the KFFSC last weekend, Brian, um, said, you know, it always seems like every year when, when we get to Vegas and we see these FFPC drafts, there's always one guy that jumps way up. There's there's always a, a guy that we used to call it the ascendant. Um, but now it, it, but the ascendant was a guy that was moving up multiple rounds. You just don't see that anymore, right? Uh, so we changed, we modified this um, – um, declaration to the hype guy, the guy who's going to get a lot of hype, not necessarily going to move up three rounds, but a guy that's going to be hyped up to the point where we will see some significant ADP movement. I've narrowed it down to five players and, and we'll talk about them. Uh, each of them here. We talked a little bit about Brooks already. Okay. And, and we listed the reasons why he could be a potential league winner and why we could see him hyped up, especially if we hear positive injury news about him heading into I, Scott Hoyt asked me, have we heard the, the, the timeline of, I thought I heard week three or four, but I, I could be wrong on that. I'm just assuming like I probably won't be able to start him right away if I draft him. However, if he's looking good and the Panthers are saying he's coming along, then we can see a player like him really move up, which is why he's on the list. We haven't talked about Brock Bowers, uh, uh, Brian. Brock Bowers is a tight end who's a rookie. And this may be, I've heard so many analysts say this, this could be the cheapest that you ever get him uh, this year because he's going to move up uh, next year. Brock Bowers, what do you think of his potential? And I know he's hurt right now, but if he gets back on the field, we could see this guy move up too. Yeah, another Georgia guy. So, you know, I'm a fan. Uh, he's He was a you know generational tight end talent. I agree. He'll probably be the cheapest he'll ever go. The main things for him is like that is probably the worst landing spot for fantasy for him as a rookie to go to the Ra to the Raiders. Um, uh, you know, I, I had heard that the Rams were trying to trade up for him, and that would have been amazing. But um, and then he picks up a foot injury, so I'm a little worried. I'm a little worried to be honest with you. There's so many other guys. Like I would, I would take Pitts over him right now. Uh -huh. um, I don't know exactly where an ADP is going. I think they're kind of similar in ADP. He's a little bit lower than, than Pitts lower. right now. Yeah. yeah, I haven't drafted him yet, to be honest. I love the player. I just don't know if it's going to be this year. I'm a little right. concerned now that, especially now with the foot injury. Yeah. I was I was just at the point where I was like, I need to get more. I need to get some exposure to him. And now he got hurt at Georgia with that foot injury, and yeah, got something again. Maybe maybe costing him some time in his rookie year. Um, you saw him at at Georgia. Is he? I mean, is he the, the next guy? Like, is he yeah. going to be? right up in the Laporta, you know, uh, uh, Dalton Kincaid, uh, Trey McBride, like level, like he's good as good or better than those guys. Yeah. He'll be in that. He, I have no doubt he'll be in that tier. Okay. No doubt in my mind. We, we talked about Cooper cup a little bit. I want to move past him. We know that he could get hyped up, but again, this guy has already moved into the second round. It's, it's tough to hype him up even further than that, especially at the presence of Puka Nakua. Um, per Mar, it's like he was looking at my list here. Malik, <laughs> Malik neighbors is the next guy in this list. We've already seen him move up. And I just think the sky's the limit for him um, with as exciting of a player as he is, as talented as he is, his big playability, the fact that he's going to get all these targets. Um, I know he's moved up a lot, but Brian, I could see him moving up even more. 
Yeah, I early, two of my first slow drafts I did, I got the nine pick back to back, and I got them in the fourth round both times, and yeah. I was like an auto pick. I, I'll still draft him in the third. I think you know the the only risk is the Giants' offense imploding and Daniel Jones imploding. That's really it. There's no target competition. He's he's going to be the alpha there right away. And um, like you said, this, you know you could see 150 targets. Sky's the limit. He could absolutely be a league winner. Yeah, I'm aggressively drafting him. I'm not sure where his ADP is now, but I think he's maybe more in the mid to late third now, if I if I remember from the last few drafts I've seen. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and I'm still targeting him. Yeah, he's he's that good. I, I agree. Uh, what about um, and the other one too, Rasheed Rice? Now, this is interesting because Rice had been steadily moving up because no suspension, no suspension, no suspension. You know, there should be a website. Has Rasheed Rice been suspended.com? <laughs> or you can just go to that website and they'll say either yes or no. Um, he hasn't been suspended yet. And Permar99 brings this up in the YouTube chat that Zay Jones, uh, a couple hours before we went on air tonight, got um, suspended for five games. Um, I think it was domestic abuse. It was, and, yeah. And, yeah. And so now Rice wasn't domestic abuse, but, I, I mean, it, it was equally reckless, you know. Yeah. Um, so now should we be getting more nervous about Rice potentially getting suspended this year? I am of the opinion where I'm, I'm still not there. Uh, I still don't think it happens, but yeah, I mean, something I see something like this, and I realize there still is a chance he could get suspended. Yeah, I was laying off him a little bit earlier on, and then once the news broke that you know he might not get suspended, I did take him a few times. So I, I I'm a little more cautious now, given that what just happened with with Zay Jones. But to your point, that was domestic violence, and obviously what Rasheed Rice did was stupid and idiotic, right. and he had. Two incidents over the off season, right? Yeah, so it wasn't just one; it was two of them. It's a matter of when, not if he gets suspended. It's just will he get suspended next year? Um, so, I think my answer would be right now at the right price. Uh, I don't know if I'd take him in the anymore in like the fourth, but if he fell to the fifth, I think it's worth a shot. I think the Chiefs are just going to have such a massive year offensively. I think Mahomes is going to have a huge year again. And if Rice is playing, he's going to benefit from it. So he's worth the risk, especially in the tournament format where you're trying to win a million bucks. Yeah, exactly. I definitely want some shots at him too. And if he gets suspended, he, he gets suspended. So um, those are the five I came up with: Brooks, Bowers, Cup, Neighbors, Rice. Is there anybody else? When I describe the, um, the 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 criteria for the hype guy, is there anybody else that I didn't list that you think should be on that list? Uh, one guy I'll mention that I've started to warm up to, and it seems like he's going a little higher. It's in that fourth, fifth round range still. It's Kenneth Walker. Oh, yeah. Uh, we've heard a lot about him maybe getting a three-down role. Then then he can catch catch the ball to the backfield, it sounds like, the new coaching staff. You know, Ryan Grubb coming in is like a more of a pro-style offense. They're not going to be the, the old-school Pete Carroll offense anymore, it doesn't seem like. They're still going to run the ball a lot, obviously. But, you know, they're going to spread it out with three wide receivers. Um, so he should get to make some plays in space and – it's, I think he's the guy clearly over at Charbonnet, and you know, Charbonnet will play and have a role. But uh, where he's going, I've been I've been taking him in the fourth and fifth round a lot. I think he's a guy that could easily, you know, next year you could see him in like the late first, early second if he hits on like you know his his upside this year. So he's a guy I really like that I think's been moving up a little bit. You're right; he has been moving up, but he is still low enough where he could st- still do some serious damage yeah. moving up. That's I'm glad you brought him up because he should be on this list. So we have to narrow it down here. Um, uh, I think Stacy Perez, when she co-hosted the show with me last year, I could be wrong on this. I thought we just did process of elimination. So out of these six guys, is there anybody that you want to eliminate right away? Brooks, Bowers, Cup, Neighbors, Rice, Walker. Well, obviously not Walker because he was added him to the list. But yeah. any of those first five, Brooks, Bowers, Cup, Neighbors, Rice. It sounded like you, you're kind of you're kind of out on Bowers. And I know that's weird coming from a Georgia fan, but I, I, it sounds like you're kind of out on him being the hype guy this year. I would probably say if I had to pick one right first, I probably honestly I might go Brooks. I just I just I'm not buying the, okay. the Panthers offense. Like yeah, like okay. I said, maybe maybe at the end of the year, but I'm you have to stash him for so long, and then yeah, so I'm, I'll say Brooks. Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna eliminate Brooks. We'll keep everybody else on the list. Is there anybody you know? Because these are, it's it's always tough. Is there anybody out of these five that maybe stands out uh, that you know? more than the other four as a, as a player who is going to be hyped up by these high stakes players drafting live in Las Vegas. Yeah. I think you mentioned Cooper cup. I mean, I think the, the reports have been good about health. You know, if he's, if he's healthy and he plays, you know, most of the season, he, uh, he can absolutely push for number one wide, overall wide receiver in that offense. You know, I think okay. he started to decline a little bit, but I don't think he's a guy that 
he's not a speed guy. He's not a guy you're worried about. Like, you know, all of a sudden he's not fast anymore and he can't separate. He's such a good route runner. And again, I just, I'm a big believer in McVay and that offense. I think it can put up just massive, massive stats. So I could see Cup really getting pushed up even closer to where Puka is now. Okay. Let's continue to be good. Now, um, uh, Scott Hoyt has a one word response to, to, to the Cup uh, uh, proclamation. Neighbors, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. Three exclamation probably the point. second guy, yeah, on that list. He'd be number two. Yeah. So if you were to rank them, you'd go Cup, Neighbors, Walker. Um, well, Cup, Neighbors, and Walker, I think, are the top three for you. And then there's yeah. there's a drop-off, right? Yeah, I'd say okay. so. Okay. So Cup, Neighbors, Walker. I, I'll, I'll open it up to the chat, the YouTube chat here, too. I think we did this last year to see what other people said. Scott obviously likes Neighbors. Rashi Rice, uh, Permar, is is a big fan of and sees. I like him too. Uh, I like him, him a lot too. God, they're, they're definitely my top four of those guys. Yeah, it, they're all pretty close. It's so tough this year. I mean, typically we always pick a young guy, and almost always it's a rookie. So I just kind of assumed it was it was going to be Brooks Bowers or uh, Neighbors, and then I think we've we've talked through it enough where we can see why Bowers and Brooks would not be as good of choices as these as these other four. Kevin Williamson also chiming in with Malik Neighbors here too. Um, yeah, I mean, I've drafted those four guys a good bit, and the two I we cut off that I cut off, you know, Brooks and Bowers, I haven't taken yet. So right. I'm just, it's how I'm drafting. So that's just how how it's kind of fallen out. So I I think, and and I'm gonna go traditional on this before we name them. I I, I just want to verify the ADPs of these guys. We we already talked about Cooper Cup going at the two twelve, and the thing is, if you're a believer in him, um, then yeah, you can totally see why this guy, um would be the hype guy if he is going to contend to be the number one overall receiver this year. And if he does move all the way up from the 212 to, you know, that 205, 204 area. Um, right now, that's where he's going. Neighbors, wide receiver 15, he's going at the 307. I'm telling you, Brian, not that I'm trying to sell you on this, but I could I could definitely see neighbors climbing up a full round into the mid-second round. I know how crazy people get with stuff like this with he's he's door number two he's the mystery like that and that's the other thing that works against cup is we kind of know what he can be but we don't know how good neighbors yeah. can be now while i would agree with you that um I, I, that cup probably should be the guy i think the hype guy everybody else is going to hype him up i think it's going to be neighbors this yeah. year no, totally I, I, I i think he's the guy that again rightly or wrongly I think he's the guy that people are going to get super excited to draft and push him up. Uh, so I'm comfortable if you are. Um, Name yeah. Malik oh, Neighbors, the hype if, guy. If everything goes, if Daniel Jones is just halfway decent and can stay healthy and get the ball to Neighbors, he could, you know, you, he could be a guy you draft in the first round next year. I mean, he's right. that good. Yeah. So yeah, no. totally. And in the fact that he's a giant and he's he's a you know a top ten pick, he gives me that Odell Beckham vibe too. Yeah, a little yeah. bit, you know. And and they're both LSU guys too. I just yeah. realized that. Uh, uh, Permar um, drafted neighbors in the middle of the second. He loved it with Drake London, Brandon Ayuk, Deontay Johnson, and Ridley. Um, Nathan uh, Klingensmith says neighbors is going to go right behind Marvin Harrison Jr. by season start. I could see that happening as mm -hmm. well. Harrison's going like right after Nakua uh, at this point too. So like Drake, Drake London up there, yeah. With those Drake guys London, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Drake London could have been on this list too. Yeah, you know I, I, I mean? I'm big on him this year too. Yeah, yeah. I, I I think that the. the you know, the second round gets a bad rap this year. I, I hear all these people all the time. Oh, I hate the second round. Every every pick in the second round sucks. Like, what? what? No, Marvin Harrison Jr., second. Drake London, what's yeah. wrong with us? Yeah. Like, there's, there's, there's a lot to like in the second early round. Early to mid-second, there's usually always a guy there I like you know, at some at some point. When you get to maybe the back half of the second, you got to start making some choices. But there's the, that run of receivers, I, I really like it, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah I, well, I, I would say that drafting in the second round, as excited as I am to do that this year, I was as excited to chop it up with you for an hour, Brian Domville. So thank you so much for coming on the show in our KFFSC preview. I should have asked you, how did your KFFSC leagues go in Cincinnati? Were you happy with them? Yeah, I was. Uh, I, I I did a little more early wide receiver in those. Um, it just kind of fell out that way. I did get uh, I did get B. John Robinson in one of the leagues and Tyree Kill in the other. I ended up at the front end of the drafts. Um, but yeah, I liked it. I, I I feel like I did. I feel like I did okay. Those are tough drafts, man. The, the, the live ones with Ket, there's a lot of good drafters in there. So yeah. I'm hoping. Which, I, but but iron sharpens iron, right? Yeah, like, it's, it's great. I mean, it, it, makes, it makes it better for the rest of the year. I'm hoping I can uh, 
I've had a, I finished a fifth overall in Kentucky a handful of years back. So I want to one day, I'm, that's my goal is to take that, the big trophy that Farrell always has there. I want to, I want to take that. And then I'll definitely come to Louisville. If I ever right. Do. Yeah, totally. I was, I was talking about this <laughs> with uh, uh, a couple, well, no, last week when we had Randy Lavender on who won the KFFSC main event last year. Uh, he said, yeah, going into the championship round, I was like 70th. And I'm like, well, you know who was first going into the championship round? It was myself and Jim Cole <laughs> who, who shared a team and we were there first. And then we put up like a 115 in, in the first round. We're like, well, that dream's over. But yeah, it would be fun uh, to win the KFFSC. It'd be fun to win the Fantasy Pros Championship FFPC main event, shooting for a million dollars there as well. You never know. You could be cashing the big check there as well, Brian. We'll continue to follow you on the X, Brian underscore Domville. Thank you so much for hanging out with me tonight. I learned a lot. Very entertaining, my friend. And uh, hopefully we'll get to we'll get to see you live and draft against each other in Louisville someday uh, or maybe online sometime with the KFFC onlines as well. All right. Thanks, Paul. This was awesome. A lot of fun. Thanks, Brian. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. That is Brian Donville, the nine-time FFPC and maybe soon uh, Fantasy Pros champion, joining me on the High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour tonight. I want to thank him uh, for popping on. I want to thank uh, the FFPC, uh, the KFFSC, uh, and, and all of you for streaming, downloading, uh, watching, uh, always fun. Now, a bit of housekeeping here. The next two weeks, this show is off. We have the Fantasy Pros Draftathon going on um, the next weekend, so I'm off for that. And then, obviously, the following week, we're at the live events in Las Vegas. So we'll be back September 13th after being off for the next two weeks. However, I can tell you that um, I believe, and this is we kind of threw it together today, I think we're going to do a special show uh, probably some live draft coverage this coming Friday. I may or may not be on, but I think at a, at a minimum, uh, Aiden LaCory and uh, Dave Chipoli would be on. And I think we might have a special guest for that. And it's a guest that you might be surprised at um, if, they, if they're able to come on. Um, and I'll just leave it at that because I don't want to overpromise. Um, but I think that's we're still going to do something next Friday night. Uh, in case you missed last night's High Stakes Fantasy Football Show on the Better Sports Network, Rewatch it on the FFPC or the BSN socials. Four for Force, Connor Allen joined me for two hours. It was a lot of fun. Next Thursday, um, Matt Schauf and another special guest will come on. Matt Schauf from Draft Sharks will join me, and I'll have another co-host uh, on that show as well as we go hard leading up until, uh, you know, every day now is going to be the biggest drafting day of the season until the season starts. Uh, 2024 Fantasy Pros Championship drafts are live. Sign up for the midnight one, 1230 or 1 a.m., uh, drafts and then FFPC main event and fantasy pros will start bright and early tomorrow. Sign up for those six hour slows uh, because they are going to be taken off the, the lobby here pretty quick uh, because we got to get those done before the start of the season. Don't forget uh, the FFPC super flex best ball tournament. Grand prize was doubled to a hundred thousand dollars this year, just $35 to enter that live and slow drafts going on there at myffpc.com. Check out the dynasties as well. Uh, go to myffpc.com, register for drafts this weekend. They are filling fast. You're not waiting around long. You're getting into drafts, less waiting, more drafting. It's what you want. It's what we're giving you at the FFPC. Remember to like this video, subscribe to the channel, comment on the video, share it with your friends and enemies, and get notified each and every time we go live, which will be um, Tuesday night. We will have a uh, live, live draft. No, I beg your pardon. Sunday night, we'll have live uh, draft coverage, I believe. Uh, that's the plan right now. And then Tuesday as well. Thursday will be the Better Sports Network. And then Friday, again, probably more live draft coverage with an extra special guest uh, to uh, sort of kick off the draft-a-thon uh, going on then. Uh, we will be back. The show will be back, like I said, uh, at, in three weeks from today. And uh, we'll take you through the, the regular season. Until then, enjoy the rest of the drafting season. Thank you so much for being a part of the show and making it awesome. Your weekend officially starts now. This has been another episode of the High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour presented by MyFFPC.com. It was broadcast live and was watched around the world. Balky and Farrell will be back next week with more analysis, more interviews, and more advice from guests much smarter than they are. Thanks for watching, and we'll talk with you again next week. One thing I, I should remember to tell you is, well, and I mentioned this at the top of the show, um, all the live stuff is filled here in at, at Caesars at the live events for KFFSC this weekend. However, They'll have main event drafts going on every single night up until the start of the season. 
Uh, those resume on Monday after the KFFSC live events end. So make sure you're checking that out. Compete with me, compete with uh, Brian and all the other luminaries that some were hanging out in the chat tonight. Uh, that I'm very excited to see this weekend that I've already seen this weekend, caught up with a lot of friends this week. Can't wait to do that uh, this weekend. And I can't wait to catch up with all of you in Las Vegas at Planet Hollywood in a couple of weeks as well. Enjoy your drafts, crush it, get out there and win that million dollars. And we'll talk to you again soon.